This Week on Waterways. Marine debris. Trashing our oceans. Two teams set out on the inviting waters of South Florida for two separate remote locations on two different days. Both teams found the same thing. The first team set out into Biscayne National Park just south of Miami using powerboats to access the remote island beaches that pepper the park's interior. The second team launched kayaks from Boca Chica Key to paddle to the coastal mangrove habitat just northeast of Key West in the Florida Keys National Marine Sanctuary and Key West National Wildlife Refuge. What did they find? Marine debris. Fishing gear, boat gear, boat shoes, flip-flops, high tops, sandals, buoys, trap line, trap doors, trap markers, soda cans, water bottles, medicine bottles, juice bottles, plastic utensils, plastic boxes, plastic bags, many plastic bags. The amount of trash that any one group can remove off a beach in a single day is pretty astounding. Um, we've had upwards of 800 pounds or more taken from a single day and that's pretty much only measuring the stuff that could be bagged. Between 2008 and 2013, we have removed over 30,000 pounds of marine debris with just our small group of volunteers. Generally, we have about 10 to 15 people. We go out, we have uh, hand pickers and trash bags and, and gloves and uh, just collecting mostly uh, stuff that won't break down in the environment. There's a couple of problems with marine debris. First, the obvious one is that it is um, aesthetically unpleasing for anyone who comes to a national park and wants to see nature, and instead they come and see mounds of trash. That's obviously a problem, but the, uh, the bigger issue for us from a, a conservation perspective is the impacts it has on our nesting sea turtles, which utilize the beaches where all of that trash accumulates. Um, sea turtles are made for swimming in water, and when they do try to come to land um, to nest, they are pretty limited in how well they can maneuver around the, the land. And so when they encounter these big piles of trash, it pretty much makes them abort their effort to nest and they'll turn around and go back to sea. Sea turtles that encounter too many obstacles at their chosen nesting area will not likely decide to find a more suitable spot to nest. Instead, if they encounter debris that they cannot surmount, they will actually make a U-turn and go back to sea without nesting. It also increases our population of raccoons on the islands because all that garbage on the shore uh, collects fresh water, which is kind of the limiting factor for how, how many raccoons can survive on the islands. The raccoons are supposed to be there, they're natural, but they're out of bounds numbers that are now being supported because they can get fresh water out of the trash leads them to eat more and more of the sea turtle eggs, which is not good for the sea turtles. But what are the sources of the trash and debris that accumulates on these national park beaches and coastal mangrove habitats? The, um, the common misperception is that all the trash that lands on our beaches are from the Miami local crowd that's using the park, but the truth is I would guess a very small fraction of the trash is actually locally derived. Um, most of it comes from far offshore um, due to our, our 
pretty much um, the rules that we have internationally where you're allowed to dump offshore um, and things circulate in the currents and the tides bring them in so it's not unusual to be picking up trash and you'll find plastic bottles that are stamped from all over Asia, South America, Central America, everywhere. It is estimated that six million tons of marine debris are added to the world's oceans each year. While 80% of that trash originated on land and was transported to the sea by wind or inland streams and rivers, 20% flew overboard, was forgotten, or dumped at sea. U.S. law prohibits dumping trash within all waters, extending 12 nautical miles seaward from the U.S. shore and in other federally protected areas, such as the Florida Keys National Marine Sanctuary. However, for ships from any country, the incentive to save money while making transoceanic crossings is high. As long as they are far enough offshore, outside of any country's regulated areas, the polluting often continues. Other sources of marine debris include lost and abandoned fishing gear and balloons released both accidentally and purposely, which is still legal in some parts of the United States. Last year we came out 28 times and removed over six tons of trash from the island and had one of the best nesting seasons ever for the sea turtles. Some of the material that we find on the island is related to commercial fishing, such as this octopus trap, which comes all the way from Portugal and Spain. Another type of marine debris that we find on Elliott Key are these helium balloons, mylar as well as latex. And when people celebrate, they tend to let these helium balloons go in the air. And what happens is eventually what goes up must come down and that many of them land in the ocean and wash up here on the shore. Well, while they're floating in the ocean, to a sea turtle, they look just like jellyfish, which is one of their favorite foods. And unfortunately, when a sea turtle ingests it, the material becomes impacted into their digestive tract, and many of them die from this. As we have learned, plastic does not break down in the marine environment. It just breaks down and photodegrades into smaller and smaller pieces. And that really is, uh, becomes not only an entanglement threat, but if uh, marine animals are ingesting these plastics, these small pieces of plastic that they may mistake for food source, or they're ingesting it with their food source, it can cause things like intestinal blockages. It can make the animal uh, not able to feed. It can suffocate them. Uh, it can cause uh, blockages in their intestinal system that, that cause them to actually die. According to NOAA statistics, over 100,000 marine mammals, including whales, dolphins, and porpoises, are victims of marine debris entanglement every year. And many of these species are listed as threatened or endangered. It is also reported that more than one million seabirds die every year due to marine debris, and over 80% of sea turtles are negatively affected by marine debris during their lifetimes. And what's happening on the seafloor is equally disturbing. In addition to what washes ashore on the beaches, um, we have to deal with the marine debris that impacts what's underwater. And Biscayne National Park is one of the largest marine parks. 95% of our resources do occur underwater, and we have over 5,000 patch reefs in the park. And we see these patch reefs are getting damaged by marine debris, um, especially um, derelict fishing gear. Each year since 2007, the staff at Biscayne National Park inventory and collect as much marine debris as their limited people hours and shrunken budgets will allow. In 2013, 
Their habitat restoration program and contractor Tetra Tech successfully removed 2.5 tons of debris from the seafloor within the park. In recent years, in an attempt to understand the effects of derelict fishing gear on coral reefs and other marine habitats, NOAA funded a monitoring project through the Coral Reef Conservation Program. Logistical support was provided by the Florida Keys National Marine Sanctuary and Biscayne National Park, as well as the Florida Fish and Wildlife Research Institute. Our program's been inventorying and tracking marine debris uh, in sanctuary waters for uh, over a decade, going back to um, the early 2000s. So this stuff is all over the place, and it's cumulative, which means that we have to do a better effort of keeping on top of it because it accumulates over time. There's a good reason for that. And it's not benign, which means that once, the, once these materials end up on the bottom, uh, in some cases, they may never degrade. Um, and even if they do, it may take a long time The other thing about debris is that we do find appreciable amounts in the no fishing zones. And there's two, there's two reasons for that. First of all, is that going back to this idea of fishing the line, the zones are very, very popular because people know you can't fish in them and they know probably that things will be larger and more abundant inside of a zone. So let's fish along the periphery of a zone. So there's a, more likely that you're going to have gear that becomes detached, angling gear. We've all been out there and been hook and line fishing and you know, your monofilament gets entangled in a rock, what have you, and, and becomes undone. But also for the trap fishery, they tend to put their traps very, very close to the boundaries of these zones. And so there's more likelihood that it's going to end up eventually in the zone when, when, uh, when you lose the gear. And secondly, of course, is the idea of poaching or non-compliance. In the Florida Keys, there are about 800,000 lobster and stone crab traps in the water in any given season. Studies conducted by the Florida Fish and Wildlife Conservation Commission estimate between 17 and 28 percent of those 800,000 traps are lost every single year. Trap fishing organizations in the Keys do participate in trap removal programs. However, according to FWC research, less than 5% of derelict traps are removed by these programs each year. That leaves more than 165,000 traps annually to the whims of ocean currents. When storm surges, Volatile seas and mighty winds ravage the waters surrounding the Florida Keys. These traps are perpetually released to nature. Whether smashed into pieces or simply severed mid rope line, these objects thrash around the seafloor, inflicting damage to immovable organisms. Line and rope can become entangled and wrap around fragile sea fans, sea whips, and other corals and sponges. We see quite often corals are damaged because marine debris, things like um, derelict fishing gear, lost anchors, um, lots of boating line, anything like that that just entangles around the corals and basically damages them until they break apart, abrades them until the coral organisms die. Um, so that is a whole other effort involved in trying to remove those things from the underwater environment. Trash and plastic in the ocean affects not just the corals, sponges, and seagrasses, those things we call biological resources. It also harms cultural resources.
the traps and the trap line get tangled up in corals, it breaks the corals. They also get tangled up in shipwrecks and other things like colonial anchors and things like that. Things that's, anything that sticks up at the bottom in Biscayne National Park is typically, typically got some kind of marine debris tangled around in it. There is a rich archaeological history under the surface of the waters of Biscayne National Park and the Florida Keys National Marine Sanctuary. These relics of our maritime past rest on the seafloor and attract sea life and visitors with their high relief and structure. The same protrusions that ensnarl fishing nets and monofilament line. Marine debris poses a serious problem to the historic artifacts on the seafloor and can permanently damage our cultural treasures. If anything gets lost when someone is fishing, they should try as quickly as possible to retrieve the item, whether it be a monofilament line or boating line, um, even little things like um, sinkers. We see those littering the reefs as well. As far as those people that are using um, lobster traps, the, the sensible thing is to deploy them far away from the reef, far enough that they are not going to be blown in by a storm and then smash into the reef. And if they do witness any um, any traps that have washed into the reefs to report them. There is also another type of marine debris that has been making headlines. According to the state of Florida, a derelict vessel is any vessel that is left, stored, or abandoned in a wrecked, junked, or substantially dismantled condition upon any public waters of the state, or docked, grounded, or beached upon the property of another without the consent of the property owner. Well, a derelict vessel is specifically described in Florida Statute 823.11 as a vessel that is wrecked, junked, or substantially dismantled. And it goes on a little further, but only a law enforcement officer can make that determination. A motorboat that has no motor, no propulsion, that uh, is obviously part of the derelict vessel definition and condition. So every boat should have a means of propulsion, whether it's a motorboat or a sailboat must have its sails. Derelict vessels come in all shapes and sizes. Some barely resemble boats, but there is something shared among these vessels. They are an eyesore to both locals and visitors. No one wants a corroded, dilapidated heap of metal and fiberglass hulking on the horizon as they gaze out from the pier or beach. Unfortunately, being aesthetically unpleasing is not where the problems end. Derelict vessels present a number of problems. First and foremost is they definitely create a hazard to navigation, especially if they are sitting in a navigational channel. They might be sunk, it could be swinging into a channel. They also cause benthic damage when they sink on top of seagrasses or coral, any kind of environment. They could be leaking fuel and oil. So it's very important to address the situation. The Florida Fish and Wildlife Conservation Commission pursues derelict boat owners who face fines or even jail time if they do not take corrective action. If that is not successful, the FWC often partners with the Monroe County Marine Resource Office to remove derelict vessels. A lot of people do buy boats, kind of live in the dream and coming down to the Keys because they, they know this is a place where you can live on the water for free. But what's missing from the equation is when they don't realize the maintenance costs that go into taking care of a boat. The most important thing in reducing the number of derelict vessels 
is for the vessel owner to realize the day that he buys that vessel that he's responsible for it and he needs to take care of it and maintain it, keep it floating, and not leave it unattended. If you see a derelict vessel when you're spending time on the water, you may notice a sticker declaring the vessel derelict. That means that the county and the state are aware of the vessel and are likely in the process of locating the boat owner. There are plenty of ways to help the overall marine debris situation. First, if you are boating or fishing from a boat or bridge, properly stow all of your trash to keep it out of the water. Also make sure all footwear, water toys, fishing gear, and flotation devices are secured. Participate in fishing line and recycling programs. The Florida Fish and Wildlife Conservation Commission's Monofilament Recovery and Recycling Program, MRRP, is a statewide effort to educate the public about the problems caused by monofilament line left in the environment and to encourage recycling through a network of recycling locations. Over 40 Florida counties now have line recycling bins in place. If you come across abandoned rope, fishing line, or broken pieces of wood, and if it can be done safely, removing it can help the marine ecosystem. However, it is illegal for members of the public to remove a derelict crab or lobster trap if the trap is intact, even if it is severed from the buoy. The best thing that you can do legally is take a GPS coordinate, report those locations of those traps to uh, your local resource agencies, whether it be the Florida Keys National Marine Sanctuary or the Florida Fish and Wildlife Conservation Commission. And we do have programs and permits in effect that will allow us to go out there and deal with those uh, ghost traps or those ghost nets if they're becoming an issue and a threat to the marine life out there on the reef. The, the park has, has, uh, has kind of limited resources for how, for how much it's able to deal with. It's pretty, the marine debris is a pretty massive problem and dealing with it is, it's, it's tons and tons of debris out there all the time. So people who are interested in helping, uh, people who love Biscayne National Park or just don't like the idea of all the trash being in the water can help. Can help. Um, uh, we have, we have frequent beach cleanups and, and we are always accepting volunteers to participate in beach cleanups to remove some of the garbage. The Florida Keys National Marine Sanctuary also organizes beach and shoreline cleanups and volunteers are always welcome at Biscayne National Park or the Florida Keys National Marine Sanctuary. Call or visit their websites for more information. And if you can't volunteer, at least be aware of how much trash you create each day and do your best to reduce your plastic footprint to help keep plastic debris out of our environment and out of our oceans. One of the biggest issues uh, here in Florida and really around the United States is single-use plastic bags. And here in Florida, about 88% of those single-use plastic shopping bags that we all get at the grocery store or you know the pharmacy uh, about 88 percent of those are never reused for anything in the united states every five seconds over 60,000 plastic bags are used every five minutes over two million plastic bottles are used according to scientists it is likely that all plastic that has ever entered the marine environment is still there. It never fully degrades. Down here in the Florida Keys, it's very hot. I drink a lot of water every single day. Um, and uh, I was notorious for you know, buying bottled water, like a lot of us do out there. And probably one of the first things I realized I had to do was change my consumption of plastic water bottles. So I think I have vastly uh, reduced and, and I, I am constantly attached to my reusable water bottle now. And that's just one minor behavioral change, but I realized that I was probably removing hundreds, literally hundreds of plastic water bottles from the environment every year just by me being conscious and having that reusable water bottle with me every single day. So, do your part. Reduce your plastic footprint as well as your carbon footprint and take steps to keep items from becoming marine debris. Use a reusable bottle.
Bring reusable bags with you when shopping. Secure all loose items while on the water so they don't end up in the ocean. Recycle your fishing line and volunteer for cleanups. Teach others how to be better marine stewards. Keep our oceans clean and our sea turtles safe. Protect the coral reefs from further degradation and contribute to the conservation of our incredible marine resources.